Hello everyone, it's 7 p.m. Eastern Time and that means it's time to begin our first evening Coco Ross Weather Talk webinar. I'm your host Henry Regis along with our technical support team of Zach Schwalbe and Noah Newman. Nolan Duskin, my regular co-host, is on a long overdue vacation on Lake Huron, but I'm sure he's listening in right now from the lake. We're coming to you live from Colorado, the Colorado Climate Center at Colorado State University in what has recently been smoky Fort Collins, Colorado. Our Weather Talk webinars are sponsored by grants from NOAA's Office of Education and the National Science Foundation. Today's webinar focuses on hurricane analysis and prediction at the National Wet Hurricane Center. After our speaker's presentation today, we'll open up the webinar for questions from our audience. All of our webinars are recorded for future viewing on the web. With us today is a friend of ours, Chris Lancy. Uh, he's the Science and Operations Officer at the National Hurricane Center in Miami, Florida. Chris has close connections with Colorado State University as he received his Master's and PhD in Atmospheric Science working with Dr. Bill Gray, who many of you know is one of the leading experts on hurricanes and tropical meteorology. Chris's main expertise is in seasonal forecasting of hurricanes, in hurricane climate variability and change, and in testing applied research projects for possible use in weather forecasting. Welcome, Chris. It's great to have you with us today. Well, thank you, Henry. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, be here and, uh, and help out. Um, are we ready to start the talk? or is it, uh, We are. We are. You know, it looks like a, you guys, an early uh, hurricane season this year, or tropical storm season, with Alberto and, and Beryl and, and uh, Carlotta going on right now in the in the uh, Pacific, uh, how common is that? Well, it is an active start for both the Atlantic as well as the Northeast Pacific. Uh, there's only been a, a couple of other years previously with two storms in each basin in May. Um, so we did get a, a breather for uh, a couple weeks, and, and uh, today we had uh, Tropical Storm Carlotta form in the Pacific again. But at least right now, the Atlantic's fairly quiet. Well, Chris, thank you for being with us today. We, we look forward to uh, your presentation. Thanks. Glad to help out. Okay. And it should be all yours. Just go and, and enlarge that to the view slideshow, and we should be good. All righty. Okay. You all see the uh, first slide? Uh, here it is. Yep, we're good. Okay, great. Okay, uh, my topic today is... Um, Hurricane Analysis and Forecasting at the National Hurricane Center. And I, I really have a unique position here at the we uh, Weather Service and the Hurricane Center. As a science officer, I get to do some marine forecasting, some hurricane forecasting, some applied research. Um, so it's, it's kind of like uh, Spock on uh, Star Trek, um, except instead of pointy ears, I get to wear really colorful flowered shirts. Um, so uh, the Next slide of a substance here is, uh, shows all the tropical storms and hurricanes in our databases for the Northeast Pacific and the Atlantic, uh, going back 160 years in the Atlantic and uh, 60 years in the uh, Pacific. And it kind of gives you an idea of the scope of the area that we have to forecast for. Essentially, we're providing forecasts for the whole Western Hemisphere for tropical storms and hurricanes. Um, so it's uh, in the, on uh, well, looking at that, you might say, wow, that, that may be difficult or impossible because it's such a huge chunk of uh, the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, but fortunately we have some great technology available today to, to help us with the forecast as well as analyzing what's going on. And I'll go into a lot of detail on, on those tools we have. So I, I think to, to start, uh, it's also important to point out the National Hurricane Center's mission. Um, so actually I'm showing here the mission statement and the vision statement, and to, to paraphrase the top one, you know, what we do is to provide the best analysis and predictions of tropical uh, and marine weather uh, so that people don't die and they can reduce property loss. Um, so we take that pretty seriously. Uh, what it also means is that unlike a university or research lab, you know, our main product is not writing papers or, or uh, uh, graduating students or bringing in grant money. Uh, what we do is for so that's our, our main responsibility. So the phenomenon that we focus on uh, is the tropical cycle. Muted. Uh, and the strongest form is the hurricane. And that's somewhat unique in uh, the Weather Service because we're not looking 
um, to f provide forecasts or the whole area all the time, but we're focused on the at the episodic phenomenon. And the driving force for hurricanes is the thunderstorm activity. Uh, so it's the, the, the deep uh, cloudiness in both the rain bands and in the eye wall, um, and that fuels the storm. Uh, so it, it generates energy from the very warm, moist uh, air that's over the tropical and subtropical oceans, liberates that air in the eye wall and rain bands, uh, liberates that energy, that is, and then uh, the cold exhaust leaves the storm. So in, in, uh, in a first order, uh, hurricanes are a heat engine uh, where it brings in air at uh, very warm, uh, moist conditions, and then uh, it leaves the system at very cold temperatures aloft. Uh, fortunately, it's not a very efficient heat engine. Uh, less than one-tenth of one percent of all the heat that's liberated from the thunderstorm activity stays in the system to lower the pressure and spin up the winds. So as I mentioned, the uh, hurricane is, is kind of the strong form of what we call tropical cyclones. Uh, and a tropical cyclone has uh, got a few key uh, definitions associated with it. First, it has to have a closed uh, cyclonic or counterclockwise surface circulation. Uh, and it also has to have uh, organized thunderstorm activity. And it also has to be what we call a, a, a non-bare clinic or, or non-frontal. Um, so if it has cold or warm fronts associated with it, uh, it's not a tropical cyclone. Um, and sometimes these criteria are difficult to, uh, to decide on. Does it meet the criteria of being non-frontal? Uh, does it have enough organized th thunderstorm activity? So often some of the, the biggest debates internally is when to start a storm, um, uh, has it reached that threshold of genesis where it becomes a tropical depression? Um, speaking of which, tropical depressions are the kind of weakest form of tropical cyclones uh, with winds less than 39 miles an hour. Uh, as it increases in intensity and reaches 39 miles an hour, it's a tropical storm, and it gets named. Um, and then it, uh, if it continues getting stronger, it becomes a hurricane. Sustained winds are 74 miles per hour or greater. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that these numbers look very precise. In reality, it's not the case. Uh, our ability to measure the winds is only about plus or minus 10%. Uh, and indeed, we only estimate them for the analysis and the forecast to the nearest five miles an hour. So if I had to start all this over again from scratch, we would have made these much more rounded uh, values because we are not that good that we can tell something is 38 miles an hour or 39 miles an hour. No, we're not that good. Chris, this is Henry. If I can interrupt you, if you could, uh, a couple of our viewers are asking if you could speak a little louder. They're having trouble hearing you. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Um, all right. That? Thanks. Appreciate that. Okay. All right. Once the uh, system reaches uh, hurricane force, uh, then we use for, for public information purposes the Saffir Simpson hurricane wind scale. And this goes from a category one, which would be a minimal hurricane like uh, Katrina when it hit Miami or Claudette when it hit Texas, all the way up to a category five from Andrew when it hit Miami uh, or Camille when it hit Mississippi. Uh, the reason the categories are important is that each category goes up in intensity, the damage gets worse by a factor of four or five. So roughly a category three is about 20 times more damaging than the category one. It's a big deal. Uh, plus it also relates very, uh, very well to the wind cause damage. Um, and, uh, and the winds really ramp up in their damage potential because uh, the damage function is about a, a square or a power of three. Uh, for uh, as it gets stronger. Hurricane uh, impacts um, can be broadly uh, set up into four different categories. Uh, on the upper left shows an example of wind caused damage from a picture I took after Hurricane Andrew. And uh, storm surge um, from uh, Hurricane Katrina that uh, uh, unfortunately occurred in Louisiana. Uh, inland flooding from uh, rainfall. Uh, that picture is from uh, Tropical Storm Allison in 2001. Uh, and tornadoes. Uh, and it may surprise folks that the number one killer is, is, is not wind caused damage, definitely not tornadoes. Uh, even inland flooding is uh, kind of the second most, but by far the biggest killer of, from hurricanes in the United States over the last hundred years has been storm surge. So as an example of the dangers of storm surge, I, 
I think the, the, this slide and the next one really illustrate the uh, potential for, for problems when a hurricane comes ashore. So this is a home about a uh, half mile from the beach uh, in a town called Waveland, Mississippi. And you know, perhaps David and Kimberly King might have known that there could be a problem living in a town called Waveland. But uh, this day was on the, uh, I believe it was the 22nd of August, 2005. And it was about two days before Hurricane Katrina made landfall. And as is typical, uh, on the outside of a hurricane, it's, it's very nice weather. Uh, you get a, the subsiding air around a hurricane. And you notice that they had their shutters. They were about to deploy on top of the windows. They were told to evacuate um, because of the danger of storm surge. And fortunately, they did. And after they came back, it took them a month to get back because of all the debris and the destruction that occurred in Mississippi. Um, this is all they had left. Uh, I'll toggle back and forth a couple times just because it's such a dramatic before and after picture. Uh, what happened there was that they had a combination of Category 3 winds uh, along with uh, about a 20-foot storm surge. And their house was uh, literally bulldozed by the, the waters. While they did the right thing and left, many of their neighbors did not. Uh, in fact, they had neighbors on their street that drowned because they thought they were safe. And uh, in addition to the almost 200 people that uh, died in Mississippi, another 1,000 died in, in, in and around New Orleans, uh, either because they chose not to leave or could not get out. And that's really a horrible situation when everyone in the United States knew that a strong hurricane was coming, yet over 1,000 people died because they didn't get out of the way in time. So this is kind of what haunts us and keeps us up awake at night. Um, to make sure that this doesn't happen again, either in the United States or our neighbors in the Caribbean and Central America. One of the issues we have at the Hurricane Center is that the coastal county populations uh, from Texas to Florida to North Carolina to Maine keep going up. Uh, and indeed, if you look at um, the US populations, both West Coast and uh, East Coast, half the US population lives within 50 miles of the coast. Um, so there's an uh, extraordinary number of people uh, potentially in harm's way when a hurricane strikes. And indeed, the hurricane-prone uh, areas have seen huge population increases, even more than that, that, that last graph had shown. So as an example from right here in Miami, um, you know, right on the right side, Miami Beach today has a house or condominium or hotel just about on every square inch of land possible. Back in 1926, uh, a few weeks before the great Miami hurricane hit, uh, there was a couple of hotels, maybe one or two houses, and that's it. Um, so you can see the massive development in a several year time. And roughly if that hurricane, that same hurricane were to hit today, it would do about $150 billion of damage. That's about 50% more than what Katrina did, because the storm was almost a Category 5, and it was about the same size as Katrina, a giant hurricane. So a little bit more about the National Hurricane Center itself. Uh, we have about 50 employees at the Hurricane Center, 40 are meteorologists, and we are the uh, Regional Specialized Meteorological Center um, uh, designated by the World Meteorological Organization, which is the weatherman's arm of the United Nations. Um, and we have the responsibility of providing uh, free uh, forecasts of tropical cyclones uh, for the Atlantic and Eastern Pacific uh, for anyone um, uh, in the United States or any country. Uh, and so we have a 10-member uh, um, group called the Hurricane Specialist Unit uh, that has uh, six months of the year forecasting responsibilities. And we have another 17-member group called the Tropical Analysis and Forecast Branch that issue marine forecasts. Um, so a little bit more about this TAF B group, because I think it's important to uh, highlight some of the work that they do, uh, given that they personnel-wise have more more people than our hurricane forecasting operations, and as well as the uh, huge area that we're responsible for. Um, we're actually providing forecasts uh, up to five days uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, Caribbean Sea, Western Atlantic, as well as the uh, Eastern Atlanta, uh, Pacific, North and South of the equator. Um, actually, just going back to that last image, 
think it's important to note, you know, that so much of the commerce today is done by ships, all these merchant marine vessels that are going across the oceans. So uh, almost guaranteed that something you're wearing right now, clothes or jewelry or, or a watch, came across on one of these boats uh, going across the, the big ocean. About 80% of the global commerce today is by these ships. Um, so uh, they want to make sure that they stay out of the way of high winds uh, and high seas. So uh, TAFB, we issue uh, over 50 uh, graphical products a day and uh, 40 text products per day. Um, and it's uh, depicting the conditions that are likely to occur, whether it's uh, the wave heights, the wave periodicities, the wave directions, so that ships can better plan their routes to avoid these uh, big problems. And the forecasts we're issuing them for are not for coastal conditions. We're not concerned with the small craft. Uh, this is big open ocean conditions. So you're looking at you know, very large uh, boats, whether they're cruise boats or uh, merchant vessels or uh, very large recreational boats. Uh, one thing that we started uh, last year that's experimental and soon to go um, uh, operational are gridded marine forecasts where we go out to uh, six days in the future, uh, providing every 12 hours a, uh, a depiction of the wind speed, wind direction, as well as the wave height, wave periodicity, and, and wave direction. Uh, again, provide more of an extended service uh, for folks that are going out over the open ocean uh, to know what kind of conditions to expect. One other aspect that TAFB helps with uh, in our operations uh, is with regard to hurricanes is that they have satellite experts within TAFB that interpret the satellite pictures and provide what's called a Dvorak classification. And that is a, um, a pattern recognition technique to decide where the center of the cyclone is, as well as its approximate strength. So these pictures here, Katrina on the left and Rita on the right, are the time based on satellite that they became a tropical storm. And that's based on having about 5 tenths banding around the center of the cyclone based on the, uh, the deep convection that's showing up in the satellite imagery. Uh, it's not as good as getting in situ measurements from, say, aircraft but it's a very good first guess about what's going on over the, the uh, ocean where there's not a lot of other measurements. Um, speaking of in situ measurements, uh, we do have the, uh, uh, we are fortunate that we have a lot more measurements today than we ever had in the past. Um, so as an example, in pink would be uh, ships going across the ocean and providing us with uh, an observation every six or even every hour. Uh, and also we have uh, moored buoys. Uh, many of these pink ones are also uh, uh, fixed buoys that are anchored to the ocean floor, giving us continuous wind, pressure, temperature, and wave information. Uh, these swaths of winds are from a, uh, a polar orbiting satellite called a scatterometer. And uh, right now we're using the European scatterometer uh, called ASCAT. And now we're testing an Indian scatterometer called uh, Ocean, uh, Ocean Scat. So we're hopeful that uh, this helps us fill in a lot of the gaps over the open ocean. One of the problems that they have, though, is that they don't, they don't do well in the mesoscale, or that is the small scale core of hurricanes. They don't really tell us how strong the, the hurricane is itself. So and this is kind of a limitation. Plus, whenever there's a hurricane out there, for some reason, the ships tend to go away from the hurricane. You know, we don't often get a ship going into the eye of the storm. I'm not sure why. Maybe they just want to survive. In addition to the in situ measurements, we also have uh, the, both the geostationary satellites that I just gave you a couple examples of for Katrina and Rita, as well as the microwave satellites. Um, these are polar orbiting or low, or low Earth or orbiting satellites that are able to peer th uh, through the, the upper level clouds or the cirrus clouds. Uh, so an example of that, this is from a tropical storm over the uh, eastern Pacific a couple years ago. And in, in particular, we have more difficulty in the analysis of what's going on at night because we don't have the visible imagery. And visible imagery is higher resolution. and We can see to the ocean surface quite a bit better. So at night, we have infrared imagery. And uh, we can even color enhance it. But if you had to make a decision of where is the center of this tropical storm, 
uh, one might say, well, may, maybe it's the geometric center of you know the uh, the green, the uh, cold cloud tops, or maybe the yellow, the coldest cloud tops. Uh, but each of these boxes is is 120 nautical miles, about 135 miles on a side. So that's a big area. We're trying to estimate it to the nearest one tenth. So fortunately, the microwave imagery that we do get on occasion helps us peer through this upper level clouds and see what's going on at the ocean surface. And for this case, uh, I'll show that a couple times here. You're able to see that the uh, um, in the red is where the, the deep convection is. Uh, in these kind of spirals in the uh, light blue are low level cloud features. And you can pretty clearly see that the center of that spiral is just on the right edge of those red uh, of that red uh, cloudiness. So it, it really helps us decide where the exact center is of a tropical storm um, because it can see through the upper level clouds. In addition to that, we have 10 C-130s at the Air Force Reserves in Keesler Air Force Base fly uh, on purpose into tropical storms or hurricanes, or even invest that is, systems that are tropical disturbances that may become a tropical cyclone. Uh, in addition to those uh, 10 Air Force planes, there's also three NOAA aircraft, uh, two Orion P3s uh, up on top, and one Gulfstream 4 jet on the bottom. Um, and for 10 years, when I was at the Hurricane Research Division, I got the chance to uh, fly aboard these aircraft into and around the, the hurricanes. And it's really an amazing way to, to study and, and help forecast what's going on when you actually get to fly into these storms. So the typical kind of flight pattern is to do a, a figure four, is what we call it, where you fly in radially to the eye, keep going out through the other side, uh, go downwind, and then go back through the, uh, the center of the storm on the opposite side. So that way, not only get to see where is the center, what are the strongest winds in the eye wall, that's the strongest winds and rain right near the center, as well as what is the size of the storm. That is, if you go out uh, radially, how far do the hurricane winds and the tropical storm force winds go out? Now, on occasion, these aircraft will get to see some amazing uh, views. Uh, they typically fly at three miles, uh, two to three miles above the ocean. And so in this case, um, this was Hurricane Georges when it was a Category 4 hurricane east of uh, Puerto Rico. And uh, this is the kind of view that they would have. You know, up above is the uh, circle of blue sky. Uh, all around is a tilted eye wall where the, uh, the thunderstorms actually are tilting with height because they're spinning so fast. And then down below, there'll be low clouds uh, above the sea surface. Um, and occasionally, you'll see uh, uh, patches of ocean uh, between some of the low clouds. Uh, and uh, you can see massive white pancakes where 30, 40, 50 foot waves are crashing into one another in the chaotic sea below the hurricane. So the best way to describe what it looks like inside a strong hurricane is is just like a giant football stadium, uh, where you've got the uh, top of the stadium where it opens up into the uh, to the sky. You got the stadium walls tilted with height, and then down below, instead of uh, in the hurricane where you have ocean uh, waves crashing into one another, you have football players beating each other up. Uh, but it's quite a sight to see. So some of the other technology we use in conjunction with the aircraft are what's called GPS drop wind sons. And so these little instrument packages, they're about a foot long. Uh, they're tethered with a little uh, a parachute. And they send us the same information as a weather balloon. So we get temperatures, pressures, and humidities, and winds. And these were dropped into the uh, hurricanes for the first time about 15 years ago. And they very quickly told us a lot new, uh, a lot of um, additional information about the structure of hurricane winds that we did not know before because we just couldn't measure all the way down to the ocean very well previously. Another aspect about uh, hurricanes that uh, we're able to, to use to our advantage is that when the uh, 
ocean is getting churned up by the winds of a hurricane. You're getting a lot of spray and foam and breaking waves. Uh, it turns out that you get a little more microwave emissions from the ocean when it does that. Um, now, that's, it's not enough to cook a hot dog from the airplane, but it's enough that you can calibrate those changes in the microwave emissions to find out what the winds are at the ocean surface. So as an example, uh, when we were flying into Hurricane Lily a few years ago, in green are the winds way up two miles above the ocean, and in red are the winds uh, at the ocean surface with this stepped frequency microwave radiometer, or what we call a SMURF. And on the other side of the hurricane, uh, in the middle was the calm eye, the winds at flight level and the surface were the same. So this is really important because nobody lives two miles up in the air. Well, we really want to know what are the winds at the surface. And you cannot just take the winds aloft and say that's what's going on at the surface. It almost never happens that way consistently. Another use of the droplet sons is in conjunction with the, the Gulf Stream 4 jet is to uh, fly a pattern. In this case, they took off out of McDill Air Force Base. And in each of the numbered dots, they're dropping a, a drop sign. And Hurricane Bill was here east of uh, Jacksonville. Uh, we circumnavigated the hurricane and then flew upwind of the storm to measure, measure the steering flow around and ahead of the hurricane. So the idea is to better measure the, the atmospheric flow that's causing the storm to be steered. And when these missions are flown, and they cost us about $20,000 to have these missions flown each time, uh, we're able to improve the forecast by about 25%. So it's, uh, it's costly, but because we're using this to help set warnings for the United States, we can better specify where the hurricane is going to hit. So that's quite a bit about the analysis and the type of measurements we have. We use the in situ measurements from ships, coastal stations, and buoys, uh, the scatterometers to help uh, measure swaths of the open ocean, the geostationary satellites, and the aircraft all those to help us analyze or figure out what's going on right now. In the process of doing a hurricane forecast, and we repeat this every six hours, uh, about a good one hour of it is just on that analysis portion, figuring out where the storm is, how strong is it, how large is it, and what is its environment. Once you know that, then we can proceed to the forecasting. So the first part of our forecasting is genesis, that is formation of a tropical cyclone. And this loop that I hope is uh, animated uh, shows uh, for the whole 2008 season um, all of the tropical weather outlooks that we issued. And you can see the, what we do is we encircle the disturbance and we color code it on the likelihood of genesis. So yellow is low chance of formation, orange is medium, and red is high chance of formation. And then once the cyclone forms, you see the, uh, the cyclone um, symbols there. Uh, so uh, this is a fairly recent development for us. And we found it really helps um, understanding uh, much above uh, just a text product, because you can actually see what the text is talking about. Um, so but to make the genesis forecast, you know, we're looking at various parameters that are related to formation. We're looking at how much spin is involved with the cyclone, how much uh, thunderstorm activity, uh, what are the water temperatures, because it's got to be fairly warm water, uh, how much moisture is close by, and also how much vertical shear, changing winds with height. Um, in addition, for looking at these environmental factors, the global weather models also are becoming very skillful in these genesis predictions. So. What I'm showing you is an example of the genesis of Hurricane Bill uh, just off the west coast of Africa. And this is for several uh, global forecast systems, or GFS runs, uh, starting five days in advance all the way until the time of genesis. And the GFS nailed it. I mean, they picked up on the genesis location and timing extremely well for this tropical cyclone. So this is a, a success uh, for Genesis prediction. On the other hand, uh, Claudette, uh, in 2009 as well, that formed west of Florida, uh, was a small cyclone. And the GFS never even picked up that it would have a closed circulation. 
uh, even six hours before it formed. Uh, so there, there still are quite a few cases where the global models don't pick up on genesis. Sometimes they forecast for cyclones that never occur. Uh, we call them uh, spurry canes. So the forecast that we issue, these tropical weather outlooks, uh, if you want to say, well, how good are they? Um, they actually verify fairly well. Uh, well. We've improved over the last couple of years. Uh, so in this uh, graph, it, it shows a, what's called a, a, a reliability diagram. So as an example, when we, if we forecast 70% chance of genesis, um, and we look at how often that was correct, 65% uh, uh, of the time, uh, we did have uh, genesis occur, and we were thinking it was going to happen 70%. So the closer you are to that diagonal, the more accurate the uh, probabilistic forecasts are. So we did fairly well. Once we do have a tropical cyclone, then we make a five-day forecast of the track, five-day forecast of the position uh, and the intensity, and a three-day forecast of the size. When we make these forecasts available, uh, we provide what's called the watch warning cone of uncertainty. Um, I've also heard it called the cone of death, or for the emergency managers, the cone of overtime, because they know once they get in the cone, they're going to get busy. Um, what you may not know is, is how the cone is constructed. Uh, the cone is not an impact graphic. It is a graphic showing the likely center of the, of the tropical storm or hurricane. And so the way we do this, it's, it's kind of slick. Um, Every forecast point, we draw a circle around it. And that circle represents the 67th percentile error over the last five years. And then we just draw the tangent to each circle, and we've got the cone. So the size of the circles in each cone is always the same. Uh, we might, in the future, make it more of a variable cone, uh, depending on the, the forecast difficulty. Um, but we might get rid of the cone, because there are many people that misinterpret the cone and think that it's an impact graphic. But it doesn't talk about wind, rain, or storm surge. All it says is, where is the likely center of the storm going to be? So how we do track forecasting, um, it's going to be explained a little bit in here. Again, what we're looking for are the, uh, the large-scale steering patterns that, that affect the hurricanes. Um, and today, the best way to do it is with these global and regional um, models uh, that uh, take the equations of motion and integrate them forward into the future. So very sophisticated models. Um, and so what the colors represent, these, these uh, so-called spaghetti diagrams, are different computer models. Um, some are British, some are European, some are the US Navy, some are the US Weather Service. Um, so, and most of them are global models. That is, they do global weather predictions. And a couple of them are hurricane-only models that are only run when we have a tropical storm or hurricane. And the official forecast that's from the Hurricane Center is in blue. Now, you can't see it because usually we're right in the middle of the guidance. And that's because when we look at on the long haul, the best forecast is basically to take all six of the best models add them up and divide by six. That's what we call a, a simple consensus uh, or ensemble. Um, another thing to note is occasionally there'll be an outlier where one model just is way out to lunch compared to everybody else. So as an example here for Ike, in red here, you can see where the red model, as the British model, was way off to the right compared to everybody else. So sometimes a forecaster can do a selective consensus, that is, throw out a single or two models, but you've got to be careful, because sometimes the one outlier is correct and everybody else is wrong. Another thing to note is that occasionally there are biases in all the models. That is, sometimes they're all too far north. So when the forecasts are here and are heading toward Florida, all the models are too far north. So a forecaster might be tempted to say, well, the models have been too far north for Ike the whole time. I'm going to shift it south. Well. That doesn't work when you got near Texas, because near Texas, all the models are too far south. So even a bias, it doesn't stay consistent even within the life cycle of a particular storm. Another point is that sometimes the models are all clustered together very tightly. 
So what there, and when it's over the Gulf of Mexico, there's a lot of clustering, a lot of tightness to the uh, track models. So you can be more confident when you have a clustering like that. When it's all spread apart, when it gets closer to Texas, uh, in this case there's a couple models that were way out in Mexico and some that were way up in, uh, in Ohio, uh, there's a lot more uncertainty there. And that's, uh, that makes it much more difficult forecast. Finally, is that the computer models can change every six hours, sometimes dramatically so. Um, our forecast isn't going to do that. We're going to be more conservative and be slower to make changes uh, because we want to make sure that it's not just a one cycle shift, that it's a consistent change in what the computer models are doing. Um, and I think that's important because we don't want to say, for example, OK, uh, the hurricane's going to hit Mexico. No, 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 it's going to hit Louisiana. No, 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 it's back to Texas. No, it's Mississippi. If we did that, you guys would say we're crazy. You know, we're not going to listen to you guys. Uh, but that's what the computer models do. They shift around constantly. So we avoid that windshield wipering left and right. And we also try to avoid the tromboning that is going too fast, too slow, too fast, too slow. Um, that might make for a consistent forecast. So if you are curious if our forecasts have gotten better, uh, the good news, at least for here, is that the answer is definitely yes. Our predictions have uh, decreased in errors by over half in 15 years. So for example, in uh, 1990, the average error was about 300 miles for a three-day forecast in, uh, in yellow. And last year, the average error was about 110 miles, so more than a, uh, a decrease in half of the error uh, just in one generation. Uh, that's a tremendous in increase uh, in predictability. Now, it's not because we had a bunch of dummies in 1990 and we've got a bunch of Einsteins today. Um, the forecasters at the Hurricane Center have always been really bright. Um, the real reason is because the forecast models have gotten so much better, much higher what's called resolution or, or uh, uh, grid spacing, as well as the satellite data that's going into the models really helps fill in the gaps over the open oceans about what's going on. Because of these improvements in the 1990s, we started issuing uh, experimentally for a couple years a four and five day forecast and started issuing them publicly in 2003. And these have improved as well. So, uh, so yeah, this is a, a great success, I think, in, uh, in the weather service as a whole and in, uh, in much improved predictability. Now, you might say, well, which is the best model? Why don't you just go with that all the time? And uh, the problem is sometimes the model that is best switches around a little bit. In particular for last year, if you want to see what the best model was, this is what we call a skill diagram, where up is more skill relative to a simple climatology and persistence benchmark. So the official forecasts in black um, have about 60% skill above a simple benchmark. And uh, the in general, the best models are these dashed ones. Those are our consensus ones. And the, uh, the pink one is basically take the six best models, add them up, divide by six. Um, and, and the, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the, the dash yellow one as well. The exception to that, though, is the light blue, especially at days four and five, is better than even the consensus. And that's the European Center for Medium Range Forecasting. Uh, indeed, the last couple of years, they've been exceptionally good. Um, so our forecasters have been putting a little more body English in the forecast on the European Center uh, compared to some of the other models. I will point out though, that the next best model is not too far behind, and that's the uh, Weather Service's global forecast system in dark blue. <laughs> Another point to make is, uh, again, going back to the cone, um, you know, when the hurricane gets close to the coast, and this is for Ike, right before it hit Texas, um, the cone is very narrow. Um, and there may be cons uh, there's concerns that I have that perhaps somebody in Corpus Christi uh, or up at Port Arthur might say, I'm not in the cone. I don't need to worry about it. Well, the cone is tiny because we know that's where the eye is going to go. But it doesn't mean that the hurricane is a point. Uh, and indeed, uh, when you look at the size of the storm, uh, the dark yellow is the uh, tropical storm force winds, and the brick red is the hurricane force winds. So 
the red along the coast shows the hurricane warning. And the warning is big because the hurricane is big. Uh, so we, well, this is a new graphic that we've been, been issuing for a couple of years now that shows the previous track of the storm, the size of the hurricane with the hurricane winds and tropical storm force winds, as well as any watches or warnings for any of the coastal locations. So I think it's a good kind of briefing uh, graphic to get an, uh, folks an idea, well, is this a tiny little system or is this a huge tropical cyclone? Because the impacts are, are substantially different. Intensity forecasting. Uh, this is an aspect that is not nearly as good news. Our forecasts have really struggled to improve. And if we look at, uh, say, a two-day forecast in green, uh, back in 1990, it was an average error of about 15 knots or about 17 miles an hour. And last year was about the same. You know, We really have not made any improvements on the forecasts uh, over the last 20 years. And it's uh, a bit discouraging, but it's, it's, it's probably a physics problem that's 10 times more difficult. Uh, for track forecasting, all you need to know is how is this hurricane going to be pushed by the surrounding winds. But for intensity, you need to know, is there dry air nearby? What's the thunderstorm structure? What's the vertical shear like? What's the ocean temperatures? What's the subsurface of the ocean? Um, so there's a lot of different players involved with intensity or peak winds. Now this about 17 mile per hour error, that's one category on the Saffir-Simpson hurricane scale. So when we make a forecast, for example, of a category two to make landfall, typically emergency managers plan for a category three because we could easily be off by a category a day or two in advance. And when we're having our worst day, sometimes we're off by two categories. So if we forecast for category two, it's not implausible that it could be tropical storm, category one, category two, category three, or category four. Uh, take your pick. That's not good. And again, it's not because we have a bunch of doofuses at the Hurricane Center. It's because we've got tools that are really limited uh, for intensity forecasts. Uh, and what I'm going to show here are some of the, or the two most sophisticated hurricane models in the world. And on the left is the uh, uh, geophysical fluid dynamics lab model. And on the right is the hurricane wharf model. And uh, on, on the top left is an example for Hurricane Felix that went across the Caribbean in 2007. The black is the life cycle intensity. So it started as a depression, storm, hurricane, quickly went all the way up to Category 5. And for the, uh, the GFDL model, it thought, well, it's going to get a little stronger. Each of the colored lines is an individual forecast. On the upper right, on the other hand, the Hurricane Wharf model never thought it was going to get stronger. Even though it went from a storm to a hurricane to a Cat 5, it never thought it would even get stronger. Um, on the bottom, it's kind of the opposite problem. This is for Tropical Storm Erica, a weak storm no one will ever remember. And it started for a week and just faded from there. And the GFDL model kept wanting to make it into a hurricane. It goes up to that 64 knot threshold, or 73 mile per hour threshold. And the H wharf was even worse. You know, wanted to bring it almost to category two status. So sometimes these models are so bad they don't even get the sign right. That is, they don't know if it's going to be weaker or stronger tomorrow. That's not good. But that's kind of the state of the art for our hurricane models. There is a lot of effort to help fix up these models as best they can, but it's a huge research effort and there are a lot of uh, brilliant folks through the Hurricane Forecast Improvement Program that are uh, trying to address this by better observations, made a better use of the model, uh, the observations of the models, and, and more realistic models themselves. So indeed, our, our skill last year was so bad, um, this shows the intensity or wind speed forecasting skill. So the zero line, you want to be above the zero line. And you can see the official forecast pretty much were below the zero line. And again, it's because our guidance was below the zero line primarily as well. Uh, so these dynamical models, the solid, uh, solid ones, showed no skill. Uh, they were quite negative. So they, they really had some 
had struggled last year. So one thing that we've done to address the uh, limitations in our intensity forecast is to place more emphasis on probabilistic guidance. So like we're doing probabilistic genesis forecasts, we're now doing wind speed probabilities. And the way we do it is pretty slick, is we make the five-day forecast, and then after that's done, right away there's a thousand-member Monte Carlo simulation, where a thousand hypothetical storms are all generated with plausible tracks, plausible wind speeds, plausible sizes. And then basically, you count up from all those thousand the wind swath for tropical storm, 60 mile per hour, and hurricane force winds to get the, the odds or, or probabilities of those different winds occurring. So what we can do now is every time we have an advisory, we have these uh, wind speed probability swaths. In addition to that, we have a text product that highlights for individual locations along the coast and inland what their chances are for tropical storm force winds, 60 mile per hour, and, and, and hurricane force winds. And to me, this is a, a really good improvement because we can't tell anybody, for example, four days in advance, they're going to have 82 mile per hour winds at their house at 5 p.m. Not going to ever happen. But what we can do, and do this today, is say, well, you've got a 30% chance of hurricane force winds at your community. You know, what are you going to do about that? And for example, if I'm a school superintendent and I hear that, you know, we've got a 30% chance of even tropical storm force winds, well, I'm going to close down the schools because that's 30% chance of kids getting hurt waiting for school buses because of fl flying debris. Um, so again, we can't make decisions for local officials on emergency management, but we can provide them better tools to make those decisions. We're using the same type of methodology for storm surge. And again, it's because we can't tell uh, anybody a couple days in advance, uh, this is for Hurricane Ike for uh, Galveston and Houston, we can't tell anybody that, on, for example, on the up, uh, right, that they're going to have 12 foot of surge two days in advance. We just can't do that because of the uncertainties involved. What we can do is, for example, here, say, well, for, uh, for Galveston Island, you know, you've got a 40% chance of your island going underwater. So if I'm mayor of that seaside town, and if there's even a 20% or even 10% chance of the island going underwater, everyone's going to get the heck out because that's a 10% chance of a lot of people dying. So you get them out, and that's the way it goes. You have to uh, overwarn so that people don't die. So getting close to the end of the presentation here, but uh, as we're putting together the forecast, we also have to uh, coordinate it with other groups. And in particular, for watches and warnings along the coastal zones, uh, we interact with the weather forecast offices. And so, uh, uh, so we make these decisions in collaboration with them. Um, also, in our public advisories, we include information about rainfall. Uh, and that's provided by the Hydrometeorological Prediction Center in Washington. Uh, also, any tornado threats uh, from the Storm Prediction Center uh, in Norman. And uh, we're able to uh, include that information within our, our tropical storm and hurricane products. Now, one thing is uh, uh, the bottom left and the upper right here are, are kind of uh, before and after pictures. Uh, so upper right is uh, our previous public affairs officer kind of let the uh, the media run amok. Um, and you know, this is Richard Pash here getting ready to make the forecast. He's not issuing the forecast. He's still coordinating it. It's not finalized yet. And yet there's all these booms and cameras in his face. Um, so our new public affairs officer, he's kept it a lot more sane. And so forecasters like Jack Bevan or, or Stacy Stewart have time to consider and think about the meteorology and prepare the forecast without the interference of the media. Another aspect to what we provide is we're, we're the official agency for all the countries in the Western Hemisphere on tropical storms and hurricanes. We're providing the big pictures, and then each weather service in each country makes their own decisions about the forecast for their country. Um, so as an example, here was Hurricane Dean as it made its way across the Caribbean uh, back in 2007. And each of these colors, um, the Hurricane Watch Warning, Tropical Storm Watch and Warning, 
represent a uh, at least one or two phone calls that we would make as we're getting the forecast finalized and helping to uh, well asking them what they want to uh, to put for their country. So, for example, as Dean was getting close to uh, Jamaica, you, we would pick up the phone, call the forecasters in Kingston, and say, "Hey, man, there's a hurricane coming. Buttons on matches." Well, maybe we wouldn't use our bad Jamaican accent, but we do have a great relationship with all the forecasters in the Caribbean, and uh, so it makes it better when we have these uh, crunch times and a hurricane is threatening that to have that trust between us and the forecasters in the Caribbean. So once we issue the forecast, it's not enough just to throw it out there and not be concerned about its communication. Uh, we spend a lot of time to upgrade our, our website and we're making more GIS accessible uh, graphics and information the last few years. Uh, we also um, do invite the media in for interviews with the uh, director and deputy director uh, on an hourly basis uh, when there's a U.S. hurricane warning in place. And we have what's called the hurricane liaison team that gets activated and they do video teleconferences uh, with the governors, with uh, Congress, uh, with state emergency managers, and on occasion even the president um, so that we can quickly and clearly convey what is going on with hurricane and its threat to the United States uh, or elsewhere. Now, one might think that hurricane forecaster has got to be the ideal gig because they forecast for six months of the year, and then they must be on vacation for six months of the year. What a great job, right? Well, that ain't quite the way it works. Um, we keep very, very busy in the off season uh, with outreach and education. Uh, for example, a picture shown here is where we're bringing in emergency managers. So these would be people that are fire chiefs and police officers and mayors and uh, emergency managers so that they can learn a little meteorology, but just to help them make those tough decisions when a hurricane comes ashore. So we host three of these classes, one week each at the Hurricane Center. We also have a two-week long class for the, uh, our partners in the, uh, web, uh, in, the, uh, in the Caribbean through the World Meteorological Organization. Plus, we try to go to a couple scientific meetings every year, whether it's the American Meteorological Society or other conferences. So we keep very busy. Uh, and indeed, our director is usually on the road for about five months. Uh, and in fact, the gentleman on the, uh, on the red shirt with the spotted tie is our former director, Bill Reed. And the guy with the striped shirt is our new current director, Rick Knapp, who just started working at the Hurricane Center again uh, about a week ago. So. Um, kind of wrap up on what we're looking at for the future. Um, you know, it's what kind of improvements can we make? You know, we're certainly going to try to or will be improving upon the forecast we're already issuing. But we want to kind of push the envelope and provide new information and new tools for folks to use. So one thing we're testing this year for the first time is a seven-day track and intensity forecast see if we can go out to six or seven days, because there are some users, um, for example, the US Navy uh, or the uh, electrical companies um, that could really use a six or seven day heads up about track of a storm. We're also doing provisional forecasts, that is, making a cyclone forecast before it forms. And we started testing in last year. It worked fairly well. We're testing it again this year. Also testing this year is the potential to issue tropical storm watches or warnings before formation. Uh, and again, because sometimes if you have a storm form close to land, it may, um, uh, it, you may really want to have a, a watch or even a warning before it, it's officially a cyclone. Also, we've been testing a five-day genesis or formation forecast for the last four years. And uh, we're also looking at doing some more testing on storm surge warnings to differentiate between, for example, a hurricane wind warning, and on the bottom right it may show an example of that in red, and uh, in blue it shows uh, what a potential storm surge warning could be. So often the hurricane wind warning and storm surge may be the same areas, but in the case of a hurricane coming ashore perpendicular and a large hurricane, and that's exactly what Katrina was, you may have storm surge warning extending much further to the right and 
the hurricane wind warning extending further to the to the left or to the west, um, because you'd have offshore winds and no storm surge on that west side of the storm. So to, to finalize here, one thing that we have to deal with, as I mentioned earlier, is that the population keeps going up, uh, both in Florida and in the rest of the U.S. and in coastal areas in the Caribbean as well. Superimposed on that are these swings of hurricane activity, where it's quiet and busy and quiet. And, uh, and this is a, a figure that Dr. Gray and I published in the Miami Herald as an op-ed piece in 2002, where we projected that it was going back to a busy period again for Florida and elsewhere. And it turned out that it was very busy. Uh, the first decade of the 21st century saw five major landfalling hurricanes in Florida. And when you're having a major landfall hurricane, you're looking at tens of billions of dollars of damages in the United States. And the potential, as we've seen, unfortunately, with Katrina, for a large number of people to lose their lives if they don't prepare adequately. So as a scientist, we kind of dig on graphs like this, so charts and graphs and figures and numbers. But I think it's important for us to also remember, always remember, is that what's really behind this graph here every one of those little red pixels, that's really representing a family or a person. And there are some families and people that, that really need a lot of help in getting ready and being informed about what's going on for hurricanes. So every one of those red pixels is a person. Some of them need a lot of help, like this family. They need a lot of help, especially this guy up top. That guy looks like a goof. So they need a lot of help in getting ready for the hurricane season. So. That's our job, to make sure families like this stay safe. So I think uh, I'll stop there. And if there's time for questions, I'd be happy to help answer some. Hello? Unmuted. Hello. Hello, Henry. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we're there. Okay. Sorry, I had the wrong button on. Chris, thank you again for the a, a, a very, very informative uh, presentation today. We I think we all learned a lot with this. Is it was really good. We love that Jamaican accent too. That. Uh, I keep job. working on it. Yeah. No, you you did real well. You know, I I'd like to point out one thing to our our folks out there that are listening in. Uh, that Coco Ross has really played an important part. I, I've talked to Rick Nabb and Dan Brown and other guys at the Hurricane Center, and they, they really appreciate the reports from the Coco Ross volunteers for post-storm analysis of the rainfall with a lot of these hurricanes, and that, that really helps them out a lot. So you guys out there that are taking your observations, um, it, it is noted, and the folks at the Hurricane Center do, uh, do appreciate that. Um, I've got a quick question for you, uh, and then we'll go on to the ones from our, our viewers out there. Uh, do you find that it's easier to forecast tracks and intensity in the Atlantic versus the Pacific, or vice versa, or is it is it about the same? You know, I think it's um, quite a bit harder to forecast for the Atlantic, both for track and intensity. Um, in track for cyclones in the Pacific, 80% um, of them are what we call 285 at 12, or 275 at 12. Basically, west-northwest, moving at uh, 12 knots. Uh, and it's, uh, they typically go out to sea and don't hurt anybody. Early and late in the season, it gets a little more complex. Um, plus, out in the uh, Pacific, you tend to have less wind shear and less dry air getting entrained into the storm. You did. So it, it turns to be, it's, it's a little more difficult, both for forecasting the position the storms are going to go, as well as the uh, the, the intensities. Mm. Well, thanks. OK, let's take some of our questions that folks are typing in right now. Uh, we've got a couple that came in a little earlier. Uh, Dave wanted to know, are there track models available for viewing on the web? So the track models you showed, can folks actually see those? Um, yeah, there, there are a few um, unofficial sites. It's not something that we uh, really want to advertise um, because we'd rather folks, folk, you know, utilize our our official forecast um, because you know we've got folks that have spent years and their expertise to try to uh, 
um, you know, understand the abilities and the biases and the models and to try to factor that in. Um, but yeah, there, there are some different sites. Um, Jonathan Bai, who's a former uh, CSU um, graduate, I think he's got a, a website that he maintains with uh, um, cycle and track models. It's one of the best ones out there. Okay, great. Well, we're going to try and stand up for about 20 minutes and try to answer as many questions as we can as we go along here. Uh, Tom writes and wants to know um, that the Atlantic hurricanes, with so many conditions, what what are the conditions that um, causes them the tropical cyclone forming off the west coast of Africa? So, what are a couple of the ingredients that go into that? Yeah, the the Cape Verde hurricanes uh, are the ones that form. Uh, relatively close off of Africa, at least between Africa and the the, uh, the Caribbean, and they're they're pretty short in season. They're, it's pretty much August, uh, kind of mid-August to say early October. So it's only about six or seven weeks long in, in season, and it's because you have a combination of uh, a minimum of wind shear, um, a, a fair amount of instability, moisture and and, and heat from the ocean, uh, as well as strong easterly waves coming off the coast. If you uh, go earlier in the year, you tend to have less wind shear but weaker waves and um, weaker instability. You go later in the season, say late October, you tend to have uh, still some fairly strong waves but um, much more wind shear. So it's, it's a fairly narrow window where you get all those things lining up, strong waves, low wind shear, and a lot of, uh, of, of of instability for the thunderstorms. Uh, Jim, in Maine, Jim in Maine writes, and he wants to uh, ask, is what do you anticipate the role of drones to be in collecting data in the future? With any any use of drones? Yeah, there's been some experimental use of unmanned aircraft already, uh, and indeed, this hurricane season and 2013 and 2014, um, NASA, in conjunction with NOAA will be flying two Global Hawks over hurricanes uh, to help monitor them. And these are fairly big unmanned aircraft, way up about 70,000, 80,000 feet. So they're well above the hurricane. And they can fly for over a day. Uh, and so the idea is you can get over the top of a hurricane and continually monitor it. Uh, and that's, that's got some great cap uh, possibilities for us. Um, to help us with our analysis issues of where it is, how strong it is, and how large it is, but also for getting that data into the different computer models. Because uh, again, we've struggled at making intensity forecast or wind speed forecast. So, uh, so yeah, that's that's real exciting. We're we're hoping to get some of that data in real time this year, and uh, we'll see how the experiment goes. But yeah, if you uh, uh, Scott Braun. B R A U N is the lead scientist on that. So if you Google Scott Braun NASA, you'll find out about the Global Hawk drone experiment. Thank you, uh, Lisa from Indiana wants to know if hurricanes can be neutralized. Has has it ever happened, or any plans for that? Well, uh, that would be wonderful if we could eliminate hurricanes. Uh, and indeed, there's been thoughts of that before. Uh, they had a, an official experiment in the 60s and 70s called Storm Fury, where the idea was to drop silver iodide in the periphery of the hurricane so that you could grow the thunderstorms in the outskirts and kill off the eye wall. Uh, problem is, it didn't work. Uh, the silver iodide was supposed to be thrown into the supercooled water, water colder than 32 Fahrenheit. There just was not enough of it. Uh, turns out thunderstorms and hurricanes aren't nearly as vigorous as squall lines over the U.S. Uh, so the whole physics just didn't work. So that, that program went belly up in the early 80s. And there really hasn't shown to be a viable alternative. Um, I have heard suggestions, and we get some interesting ones every year, uh, that we should nuclear bomb a hurricane. Um, and that sounds like a promising idea, right? Nuclear bombs very very... Uh, very uh, powerful, um, but a hurricane by itself generates so much energy by its that condensation process that it's, it's about the same amount of energy that all of the Earth's electrical systems that mankind put together, all together equals one hurricane. So 
even a nuclear bomb kind of pales in comparison with that amount of energy that's being released by a hurricane. Plus, then you'd have a radioactive hurricane. Um, so it's not going to make it worse. Uh, it's not going to destroy it, and then you'd have a lot of radioactivity. So um, there really isn't a, a, a viable way to get rid of hurricanes. I, I think we just have to better prepare for them and better forecast them. Thank you. J Jeff in uh, Idaho uh, wants to know, how do the swings in hurricane activity relate to El Nino and La Nina patterns, if at all? Right. El Nino and La Nina are the, uh, the biggest year-to-year -year, um, fluctuations uh, that are seen in hurricanes. Uh, El Nino is the warming of the uh, equatorial eastern Pacific waters, and La Nina is the cooling of the waters. And both have global changes in the, uh, the atmospheric systems around the Earth. So one good thing that an El Nino tends to do is, is cut down the number and the intensity of hurricanes in the Atlantic. And it does show by, by having uh, more wind shear uh, tear apart the hurricanes. And it also causes uh, more sinking and drying over the hurricanes. Uh, so this year, there's about a 50% chance we'll have a significant El Nino this year. Uh, so if we do, then it may turn out that there will be a fairly quiet season. Uh, right now, the NOAA seasonal forecast is, is calling for a near average year. Um, but uh, if the El Nino is stronger than what's, uh, what's being guessed currently, it could end up being fairly quiet. Okay, Chris. Uh, Rick in Georgia wants to know, is your department subject to budget cuts? He wants to know to do the critical logic nature of your work, I uh, hope that you're getting the people equipment you need when you need it. Well, we've been, I think, very fortunate at the National Hurricane Center for uh, funding within the Weather Service. Uh, we've actually added in the last, um, I guess, five, six years, uh, a few positions. Uh, we've uh, added four hurricane forecasters, uh, and we added a branch chief. and a. Uh, so we, we've, we've been, I think we've done very well. We certainly have enough um, to get the job done, and uh, you know we, we can't complain. I, I think we've been very very uh, treated very well within the weather service and NOAA as a whole. So I, you know who knows what will happen in the future, but right now we're doing well. Rich, Richard writes in and wants to know what prevents a hurricane from crossing a cold front. Well, sometimes hurricanes do collide with cold fronts. Um, cold front almost always wins. Uh, cold fronts are, are associated with uh, upper level trough, and upper level troughs typically have very strong uh, uh, winds out of the west, and so that uh, that means a lot of wind shear. And uh, anytime you get more than even about 20 or 25 mile per hour difference in the winds between the low levels and the upper levels, that's enough to essentially what you call could say decapitate a hurricane. Uh, and so that's, uh, yeah, that's usually what happens. Occasionally, um, a hurricane will uh, transform into uh, uh, an extratropical cyclone, uh, and so it, it may gain fronts as it's moving forward, uh, and occasionally that we'll see a storm get all the way to Europe and cause some, some damage out there. It won't be a hurricane any longer, but it would still be the same cyclone, but it's just transformed from a uh, hurricane that's fueled by thunderstorms to a, a winter storm that's fueled by the, the frontal boundary, the temperature contrast. Cameron writes and wants to know if you've ever been in a hurricane. I know you've been in a hurricane hunter. Have you been on the ground in a hurricane? I've been um, on the ground in two hurricanes. Um, the first, uh, my parents moved to Miami from Illinois uh, in August 1965. And uh, I was six months old. And uh, two weeks later, we got hit by Hurricane Betsy. And my Midwestern parents were about ready to turn back and get the heck out of there. Um, didn't have another hurricane in Miami for 27 years. Uh, and, then, uh, and then the one 27 years later was Hurricane Andrew, which was Category 5. Uh, the only other one I've experienced um, on the ground was, uh, uh, was Hurricane Wilma. And that was... Uh, amazing to, 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 to experience. Uh, it went across very quickly. It was a very large hurricane. Category 3 when it made landfall on the west coast of Florida. Category 
a high end one or low end two when it got to Miami, all the power went out in Miami, Fort Lauderdale, and Palm Beach for a week to two weeks. And it was chaos after that. So it was fun going through the hurricane. It was a pain in the butt afterwards for a couple weeks. Stephen Wrightson wants to know if the people who work at the uh, National Hurricane Center are meteorologists. Yeah, we have um, 50 uh, people that work at the National Hurricane Center and uh, 45 are federal employees. Uh, we do have a half dozen folks, uh, contract folks on soft money. Um, and I think it's uh, 35 uh, or 37 that are actual meteorologists. Uh, so it's, you know, most of our staff are, are forecasters. Um, so we do have uh, about a half dozen very skilled uh, computer scientists as well. And that, that part is crucial, too, because we need to make sure that we get access to all the computer models and the satellite data and the aircraft data and also make sure that our products all go out. And that's, uh, that's a pretty hefty job uh, in, and also maintaining the security issues that, uh, that go along with um, keeping that network up and running. Uh, Nancy writes in and wants to know, how is it that planes that fly into and out of hurricanes can do so safely. It seems like it would be a very dangerous thing. They do so because they're pretty, they're pretty much like armored tanks. They, um, they're, they're very strong. Uh, they actually have wings that are a little flexible um, so that they can bounce a little bit because uh, so they can take the turbulence without the wings being torn off, uh, which is a good thing. Um, and they also fly high enough uh, usually at two miles above the ocean, so that if they do lose control of the plane for a few seconds, uh, they'll have time to, uh, to, to regain control of the plane and get everybody out of there. Um, the good news is that there's not been a hurricane reconnaissance plane in the Atlantic to, to crash um, for over 50 years. Um, there's been a couple close calls, uh, mainly because some folks were not doing perhaps the, the best thing. Um, but we've been very fortunate that, uh, that no one has gotten uh, hurt or se her seriously hurt or killed in a, in a long time in a hurricane aircraft. Thanks. Um, Scott wants to know, what is the difference between a cyclone and a hurricane? He thought that a cyclone was in the South Pacific, hurricanes are in the Atlantic. And it's funny, as you drive through Denver here, there's a picture of a tornado, and it's the Hurricane Drain Company. So people, anyway, it, it, uh, I guess folks can get confused with the terminology. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you can uh, still see my, my screen, but, uh, but yeah, we, uh, the generic term is tropical cyclone. And in the Atlantic, the strongest version is called hurricanes. In the East Pacific, they're called hurricanes. Uh, in the Northwest Pacific, they're called typhoons. And in the South Pacific and the Indian Ocean, they're called cyclones. Um, so they're, they're pretty much all the same thing. Uh, they're just given different names. Um, the only real st structural difference is that south of the equator, they spin the other way. Uh, so they spin clockwise south of the equator and counterclockwise north of the equator. OK, um, let me get another question in here. We, we've got some more. Can, can you stay on for a few more minutes, Chris? Yes, I can help out, sure. OK, OK, great. Um, let me see what we hear here. It, uh, Mike writes and wants to know, if you could get more or better data, what would you want? So I think he's asking uh, what type of data. I'm not sure that, what he's asking that question. Yeah. Yeah, well, you talk to any meteorologist, they always love having more observations, more data. Um, and we're, we're definitely the same way. Um, I think the data that we lack most uh, right now is size of the storms. How big are the hurricanes? Do you have, you know, the hurricane winds extending out 10 miles or is it 100 miles? And right now we're we're pretty much guessing, and that's that's um, that's something that would be nice to have more objective techniques to determine the size of storms. Um, so you know if. if the U.S. had a scatterometer again, uh, that would help fill that gap. Uh, but the NASA quick scat uh, went belly up in 2009, and there has not been a replacement of it at this point. Um, so we're, we're using the European scatterometer, and we're testing the Indian scatterometer. But 
uh, they uh, they don't quite uh, match up to what the quick scat was able to do. Stan in Port Charlotte, Florida, asks, "How is the data recovered from drop sounds? So how do you get that data?" Right, the the drop sounds are launched from the aircraft, uh, and they have a, a little radio transmitter. So we get the data back on the airplanes, and then uh, there's meteorologist on board the airplane that decodes the message and uh, and corrects any obvious errors, and then they transmit it out with a uh, satellite phone um, back to Washington D.C. Um, so that uh, that we can get the uh, the information, and not only the drop sound information, but the, um, the the flight level, temperatures, winds, and pressures, and uh, aboard the uh, the Orion P3 aircraft that NOAA has, uh, there's also a, an airborne Doppler radar, and that Doppler radar information is being transmitted now uh, in real time. Um, so that's that's been a, a big advance in our ability to. Uh, help monitor these storms way out over the open ocean. Nancy writes to tell you that you have the coolest name ever for a meteorologist. Your last name. <laughs> and on there. Well, uh, th thank you. I, uh, you know, when my wife and I were thinking about uh, naming our kids, and I and I showed you a picture of uh, of uh, of our our last kid there. Um, the name that first came to mind was uh, Aaron because it could be used for a girl or a boy. And so it would be A-A-R-O-N for a boy or E-R-I-N for a girl. And then the kid's name would have been Air and Land Sea. So we figured <laughs> they would hate us later in life. So instead, we named our kids after retired hurricanes. That's great. Um, we've got one here from Lisa wants to know what are some emergency procedures that we can follow to minimize the damages caused by hurricanes. She notes in Japan they have buildings that are made so they don't they don't fall down. Is there is there something folks can do to minimize those those damages? Yeah, there's a lot. Uh, in fact, after Hurricane Andrew in Florida 20 years ago, uh, the building codes here have been made to be one of the strongest in the United States, if not the world, for dealing with hurricanes. Uh, any new coastal home has to be equipped with either storm shutters or hurricane-proof glass. Uh, you have to have uh, a, a garage door that looks like an armored tank with its extra uh, struts and, and, and braces. Um, you know, there's a lot that you can do to, you know, better pr pr uh, protect your home. The main things to protect would be the windows and doors, as well as connecting the roof to the main uh, walls of the house. Um, I'm not sure if a lot of folks know this, but most homes, the roof is only attached to the walls of the house by gravity. That's it. And, uh, and so there's things called hurricane straps that are just simple metal straps that attach the frame of the roof to the, to the walls of the house so it doesn't fly away. Um, you don't want your roof flying away in a hurricane. So, um, so yeah, th those things can dramatically decrease the damage and yet only increase the cost of the house by five or at most ten percent. Uh, we have a, a, uh, <clears throat> a viewer that says, why is the eye of a hurricane so calm, they wanted to know. Well, the, uh, it's, uh, the eye of the hurricane uh, is calm and it's surrounded by the eye wall, which is the ring of high winds and high rain. And it's just a function of the dynamics that as you're getting the wind coming in, it can't make its way all the way to the center because uh, it just uh, it reaches some resistance. It goes up in the eye wall, and then in between you have weakly sinking air. Um, so it, it, it's, a, it's a function of just about any vortex. Uh, it's also true with tornadoes. You can even see that in a uh, you know, little... Uh, bathtub vortex too. That uh, you have sinking in the middle of the vortex, and the, the upward part is uh, the eye wall or the the, uh, the vortex of the tornado itself too. Okay, we're going to just take about three more questions. Uh, Doug from New Hampshire writes, in the King photos from Katrina there in Mississippi, you showed uh, indicate that tr the tree survived the wind and storm surge pretty well. Is that pretty usual? Uh, trees do well in that. Yeah, that's that's a good question. The uh, uh, the tree is is a live oak, and I, I 
I got an interest in native plants in the uh, in the Florida and the Southeast U.S. Live oaks are just extremely sturdy trees, and they can just take incredible winds and not be torn apart. Uh, other trees um, uh, deal with hurricanes by shedding limbs so that the main trunk stays upright. And so we've got a lot of subtropical trees here in Florida, like uh, gumbo limbo or paradise tree, that they may they move, may lose a lot of their leaves and a lot of the limbs, but uh, the main trunk stays upright. So there's just different adaptations by the tropical trees. Either they're sturdy as heck, like the live oaks or the mahoganies, or they lose their limbs so that the, the main uh, trunk stays, uh, stays intact. Hmm, very interesting. Um, here's one here. Uh, if, if what caps a hurricane? So do they vary in height? I know you know certain thunderstorms will go up to fifty, sixty thousand feet. Is there is there certain heights that hurricanes reach? Right, hurricanes uh, since they're fueled by the the thunderstorms and the thunderstorms tops are as what we call the tropopause. And in the tropics, that's that's about fifty or uh, so thousand feet up in the air, uh, and so the the thunderstorms are generating, releasing all this heat. Some of it stays locally in the hurricane to cause a, a low pressure by the warming, and so that's the kind of limit to the vortex is the top end of that warming. So um, the hurricane is strongest about a, a half mile or a mile above the ocean. Uh, it's a little weaker at the ocean surface because uh, friction from the ocean or land slows the wind down. So it's strongest just above the ocean, and it gradually weakens to nothing by the time you get to 50,000 feet. Thanks, Chris. We're going to take the last question, and the last question of the day is, are our Kokoros rain gauges accurate? How accurate are they when rain is falling horizontally in a hurricane? And that's an interesting question. Um, Perhaps Nolan would be better off, or uh, not better off, but also qualified to answer that. Uh, you know, here in, in Wyoming, they sometimes put the rain gauges sideways since the wind blows so much. Um, what do you think, Russ, with, with the, uh, with the uh, accuracy with that blowing, blowing rain? Well, I, I guess it would depend on if you have a, a wind shield to, yeah. uh, to, yeah. to mitigate the effect of the wind. Um, but even that might be problematic when the winds are blowing 50 or 80 or 100 miles an hour. Um, so yeah, I think you have to be, uh, if you're looking at a database of rainfall uh, from hurricanes, you have to take that into account that, you know, that because the wind is blowing the rain around so severely, you, you might be under-reporting the total amount of rain. Yeah, a lot, we found two folks out there that uh, take the top off your gauge. A lot of times those those funnels will blow off uh, in, in hurricanes. So, well, Chris, thank you again for your time. Uh, just really appreciate you being on with us today. Some amazing stuff. I think we've all learned a lot. Uh, Chris will try to answer. We have a few more questions. We're going to run out of time, but he'll uh, try to answer those through email. And Chris, we hope to see you out here next month. I don't know if you're going to make it for the uh, Colorado State reunion, but uh, I'd love to see you personally. I'm looking forward to getting back to Colorado soon, yes. Okay, great. Well, thank you once again, everybody. I appreciate your time, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll be in touch. Great. Thank you, Henry, and thank you, everyone. Okay, bye, everyone. Bye-bye.